You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Section one. You will hear a student talking to the student accommodation officer at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I've just been accepted on a course at the university, and I'd like to try and arrange accommodation in the hall of residence. Yes, certainly. Uh, please sit down. What I'll do is fill in a form with you to find out a little more about your preferences and so forth. Thank you. So, first of all,、um, can I take your name? It's Anu Bhat. Could you spell your name, please? Yes, A N U B H A D B T. Thanks. And could I ask your date of birth? The thirty-first of March, nineteen seventy-two. Thank you. And where are you from? India. Oh right, and、um, what will you be studying? I'm doing a course in nursing. Right, thank you. And how long would you want to stay in hall? Do you think? Well, it'll take three years, but I'd only like to stay in hall for two. I'd like to think about living outside for the third year. Fine. And what did you have in mind for catering? Do you want to cook for yourself or have all your meals provided? That's full board. Is there something in between? Yes, you can just have evening meal provided, which is half board. That's what I'd prefer. Yes, a lot of students、uh, opt for that. Now, with that in mind, do you have any special diet? Anything we should know about? Yes, I don't take red meat. No red meat. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, thinking about the room itself, we have a number of options.、Uh, you can have a single study bedroom, or you can have a shared one. These are both what we call simple rooms. The other alternative is to opt for a single bedsit, which actually has more space and better facilities.、Uh, there's about twenty pounds a week difference between them. Well. Actually, my grant is quite generous, and I think the bed sit sounds the best option. Lovely, I'll put you down for that, and we'll see what availability is like. Now, can I ask some other personal details which we like to have on record? Yes, of course. I wonder if you could let us know what your interests are. This might help us get a closer match for placing you in a particular hall. Um. Well, I love the theatre. Right. And I enjoy sports, particularly badminton. Ah, that's worth knowing. Now, what we finish with on the form is really a list from you of what your priorities are in choosing a hall, and we'll do our best to take these into account. Well, the first thing is I'd prefer a hall where there are other mature students, if possible. Yes, we do have halls which tend to cater for slightly older students. Ah,、mm. uh, and I'd prefer to be out of town. 
That's actually very good for you because we tend to have more vacancies in out of town halls. Ah, lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anything else? Well, I would like somewhere with a shared area, a, a TV room, for example, or, or something like that. It's a good way to socialize. It certainly is. That's it. Now we just need a contact telephone number for you. Oh, uh, sure. I'll just find it. Um, it's a double six seven five four nine. Great. So we'll be in contact with you as soon as possible. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear a guide giving a tour of a park. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome to all of you. Can everybody see and hear me? Good. I'm Sally, your guide for this tour of the Bicentennial Park. I hope that you're all wearing your most comfortable shoes and that you can keep up the pace. So let's get underway on our tour around this wonderful park. I'll start today with some general background information. There used to be a lot of factories in this area until the 1960s. Creating the park required the demolition of lots of derelict buildings on the site, so most of the exciting park space all around you was originally warehouses and storehouses. The idea of building a public park here was first discussed when a property developer proposed a high-rise housing development. But the local community wasn't happy. If the land was to be cleaned up, they wanted to use the site for recreation. Residents wanted open space for outdoor activities rather than housing or even an indoor sports complex. Now to the bicentennial park itself. It has two areas: a nature reserve and a formal park with man-made features and gardens. The tall blue and white building in front of us is called the Tower, and is the centre point for the formal gardens. It stands twelve metres high, so follow me up the stairs to where we can take advantage of the fantastic views. Before you hear the rest of the tour, you have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Oh, well, here we are at the top of the tower, and we're going to look at the view from each direction. Out to the east, the large buildings about a kilometer away are on the Olympic site. There's an indoor arena for gymnastics, a stadium for track and field, and a swimming pool for races and synchronized swimming. And also diving. If you look carefully down there, you can see the train lines. The Olympic site has its own station to encourage the use of public transport. There is also a car park, but it only holds a limited number of cars. The formal park has some specially created water features. If you look out here to the south, you can see a circular ornamental pond, and around to the west. You can relax and sit on a bench to smell the flowers in the rose garden, 
And finally, up to the north, if you look in front of you now, there's a lake with a small island in the centre. You can hire rowing boats at the boat shed, which you、um, can't see from here. But if you look through the trees, you can see the cafe, which has lovely views across the water. Okay, let's climb down now. We will go now and have a look at the nature reserve section of the park, which has opened up natural wetland to the public. The mangroves have been made more accessible to visitors by the boardwalk built during the park's upgrade. You'd think that people would come here to look at the unusual plant life of the area, but in fact, it's more often used for cycling and is very popular with the local clubs. This is the far end of the park, and over there you can see the frog pond, a natural feature here long before the park was designed. Just next to it, we have our outdoor classroom. A favourite spot for school parties, the area is now most often used by primary schools for biology lessons. And finally, let's pass by the waterbird refuge. This area is in a sheltered part of the estuary. That's why the park's viewing shelter is a favourite spot for bird watchers who can use it to spy through binoculars. You can watch a variety of waterbirds, but most visitors expect to see black swans when they come to the shelter. You might spot one yourself right now. Well, here we are back at our starting point, the visitors' centre. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. You will hear the director of studies in an English language centre and a student representative talking about their self-access centre. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hi, Yun. As you know, I've asked you here today to discuss the future of our self-access centre. We have to decide what we want to do about this very important resource for our English language students. So, can you tell me what the students think about this? Well, from the students' point of view, we would like to keep it. The majority of students say that they enjoy using it because it provides a variation on the classroom routine, and they see it as a pretty major component of their course. But we would like to see some improvements to the equipment, particularly the computers. There aren't enough for one each at the moment, and we always have to share. Well, yes, the teachers agree that it is a very valuable resource. But one thing we have noticed is that a lot of the students are using it to check their personal emails. We don't want to stop you students using it, but we think the computers should be used as a learning resource, not for emails.、Mm. Some of us also think that we could benefit a lot more by relocating the self-access centre to the main university library building. How do you think the students would feel about that, Yun? Well, the library is big enough to incorporate the self-access centre. But it wouldn't be like a class activity any more. Our main worry would be not being able to go to a teacher for advice. I'm sure there would be plenty of things to do, but we really need teachers to help us choose the best activities. Well, there would still be a teacher present, and he or she would guide the activities of the students. We wouldn't just leave them to get on with it. Yes, but I think the students would be much happier keeping the existing setup. They really like going to the self-access center with their teacher and staying together as a group to do activities. If we could just improve the resources and facilities, I think it would be fine. Is the cost going to be a problem? It's not so much the expense that I'm worried about, and we've certainly got room to do it. 
but it's the problem of timetabling a teacher to be in there outside class hours. If we're going to spend a lot of money on equipment and resources, we really need to make sure that everything is looked after properly. Anyway, let's make some notes to see just what needs doing to improve the centre. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now, what about the computers? I think it might be a good idea to install some new models. They would take up a lot less room, and so that would increase the workspace for textbooks and so on. That would be great. It is a bit cramped in there at times. What about other resources? Do you have a list of things that the students would like to see improved? Yes, one of the comments that students frequently make is that they find it difficult to find materials that are appropriate for their level, especially reading resources. So I think we need to label them more clearly. Well, that's easy enough. We can get that organised very quickly. Mm. In fact, I think we should review all of the study resources as some of them are looking a bit out of date. <laughs> Definitely. The CD section especially needs to be more current. I think we should get some of the ones that go with our latest course books and also make multiple copies. Good. Now, I was also thinking about some different materials that we haven't got in there at all. What do you think of the idea of introducing some workbooks? If we break them up into separate pages and laminate them, they'd be a great resource. The students could study the main course book in class and then do follow-up practice in the self-access centre. That sounds good. OK. Now, finally, we need to think about how the room is used. I'll have to talk to the teachers and make sure we can all reach some agreement on a timetable to supervise the centre after class. But we also need to think about security too, especially if we're going to invest in some new equipment. Um, what about putting in an alarm? Good idea. The other thing I'd like to do is talk to our technicians and see whether we could somehow limit the access to email. I really don't want to see that resource misused. What about if we agree to only use it before and after class? Yes, that would be fine. OK, anyway, that's great for now. We'll discuss it further when we've managed to... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about a chemical substance called monosodium glutamate. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about monosodium glutamate, 
or MSG, as it's more commonly known. Now, MSG, as you probably know, is a flavor enhancer, which is used particularly in Chinese and Japanese cooking. Today, I am going to explore why it is so popular in these cuisines, and more importantly, how does it enhance the flavor of food? The main reason why MSG is more commonly used in Japanese meals is tradition. For many thousands of years, the Japanese have incorporated a type of seaweed known as kombu in their cooking, as they discovered it had the ability to make food taste better. But it wasn't until 1908 that the ingredient in kombu, which was responsible for the improvement in flavor, was actually discovered to be glutamate by scientists working there. From 1908 until 1956, Glutamate was produced commercially in Japan by a very slow and expensive means of extraction. It was in 1956 that the speed of the process was improved and industrial production increased dramatically and still continues to increase to this day. In fact, hundreds of thousands of tons of MSG are produced all over the world today. So, what exactly is MSG? Well, monosodium glutamate contains 78.2% glutamate, 12.2% sodium, and 9.6% water. Glutamate is an amino acid that can be found naturally in all protein containing foods.、Um, so, this includes foods such as meat and cheese. It is widely known that Chinese and Japanese food contains MSG, but many people don't seem to be aware that it is also used in foods in other parts of the world. For example, it is found in commercially made Italian pizzas, in American fast food, and in Britain, MSG is used in things like potato crisps. So, how exactly does MSG work? Well, in the Western world, we commonly talk of Four tastes, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the concepts of sweet, sour, bitter, and salt. Well, in 1908, Kiku Nae Ikeda identified a fifth taste, and it is thought that MSG intensifies this naturally occurring taste in some food. It does make perfect evolutionary sense that we should have the ability to detect or taste glutamate. Because it is the amino acid which is most common in natural foods. John Prescott, an associate professor at the University of Chicago, suggests that this fifth taste serves a purpose just as the other tastes do. He suggests that it signals to us the presence of protein in food, in the same way that sweetness indicates that a food contains energy giving carbohydrates. Bitterness, he says, Alerts us to toxins in the food, while sourness warns us of spoilage, and saltiness signals the presence of minerals. So, what else do we know about this fifth taste? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Like, share, subscribe the channel, and press the bell icon for further updates.